Uh, the sermon that I'm getting ready to preach to you right now, I literally decided while I was standing over there. That's what I was talking about. Okay, so I don't know what I'm about to say. But I know who's about to help me say it. Okay. I, I want to I wanna stay uh, between the cross and Pentecost. We're, we're getting there. But I still want to stay in between there. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. Luke 23 and 43. I got one verse. And I know when I say that, some of y'all happy. Like, ooh, this is going to be a short sermon. You only got one verse. Well, that depends on if you say amen. All right. You didn't say amen too fast, Brother Warner. <laughs> Luke 23 and 43. And Jesus said unto Kirk. So I, you got to put yourself in here because if you don't put yourself in here, you just gonna be like, oh, it's good. But it's the, it's the doctrine of substitution. Okay. Are you with me? So it's okay because we are under the new covenant for you to assume that the promises of Israel are now yours by blood, not by birth. So Jesus said unto the lighthouse, Verily I say unto thee, Today. See, I should have just named the sermon today because you've been waiting all of this time and you finally got to the place where it's going to happen. Somebody say today. today. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. My God. So you heard that verse so many times you don't even understand the power of it. That's a Sunday school verse. That's an that's a Easter speech verse. But this is powerful. He says... You don't have any credentials. You're not in ministry. You're not a deacon. You're not in a five-fold ministry. I've never heard you speak in tongues. But because you want me, I want you. And because you want me, I'm going to forget every negative thing anybody ever said about you. And I'm not taking any calls on people. You know if you get her, if you get him, you ain't getting nobody that can be trusted. I'm going to forget all of that. And I'm going to make my decision up on you based on myself and the interaction we're having today. So in spite of your past, today. Me and you going to be together forever. Are you with me? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Lord, I can't preach unless you give me power. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk on the subject for just a few moments. The first 48. The first 48. How many of y'all ever seen that show? The first 48. One of my favorite shows. And um, if you've ever seen it, those of y'all who are not familiar with it, let me just make sure that y'all, how many of y'all have not seen the first 48? Raise your hand. Father, whatever they have been doing. <laughs> I beseech you by the mercies of God. This show been on for like 25 years. So if you ain't seen it, <laughs> I'm just kidding. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a, it is a, a documentary type of um, uh, show that, that documents the details of, of homicides, mostly in communities of black and brown people. And, and Houston so, so gangster, they won't let the show be called Houston. It's called Harris County, Texas. <laughs> um, and, it, and it investigates these homicides over these 16 urban centers where largely brown and black people um, are, are involved.
involved in, in homicides. And let me just say this, even though this isn't a part of the message. Black people, don't let anybody make you think that black on black crime is any bigger than any crime against us. Because there are more black people killed by non-black people than are killed by black people. I just want you to put that because people will have us thinking that we're destroying ourselves. Although we are partaking in it, we are not the only ones. And if you watch this show, you would think that only black people kill black people. In these urban centers where there is poverty and job loss and high unemployment rate. And it is sad to see because you always know what's going to happen. Somebody's going to kill somebody and then they're going to get somebody in the interrogation room, give them a bag of chips and a Coca-Cola and in about five minutes, they're going to be telling everything. You're going to see the hardest dudes you ever saw in your life that killed 10 people, but when they hear life, the tears start coming down their eyes. And, 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 and so when you watch it, uh, there is this narrator and he has this, this saying that you, you, could, you could be in the kitchen, but if you hear uh, this, this, this thing that comes in, and the odds of catching a criminal are greatest when law enforcement discovers a lead within the first. I knew you seen it. I knew you did trying to act like you hadn't seen it before. And if you've ever seen the episode, it always plays out in an interrogation room where they obviously turn the air conditioned down because they always have their arms in their shirt and they're always cold and freezing. And you always know they're guilty because they lay on the floor. Have you ever seen them? <laughs> when they lay on the floor, I'd tell my wife, he did it, he did it. <laughs> they bury their faces in, in, in their legs and their knees and, and they just already know that it's over and, um, and, and typically these people, uh, you can tell when they go and interview the parents after it's over, they interview them and they're from broken homes and, uh, and, and, and some of them don't know where their father is or their mothers are strung out uh, on drugs. It's just, it's a sad scene to look at and it is obviously disturbing that, that we, and I say we, are entertained by such plights that we're looking at real life unfold uh, in a docu-series format, but it ain't fake, it's real. Because on the other end of that, there's a mother who has to relive the death of her son. There is a mother who has to relive the death of her daughter. And although we're sitting back and making fun and jokes about it, it is a sad scene to know that that because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, I could lose my life. It's sad that every time we turn the TV on, six people have been killed, nine people have been killed, eight people have been killed. It is, and, and we're getting desensitized to it, but I don't want you to get desensitized to it. I want you to fight back and let the Holy Spirit know that we still believe you're in charge. That every place our foot shall tread that God shall give us safety. Somebody say, I'm safe everywhere I go. Come on, let's just make that de declaration. I'm safe in the movies. I'm safe at church. I'm safe at the grocery store. I'm safe on the highway. Come on, anybody need the, the Holy Spirit to cover you everywhere you go? I'm safe at the football game. I saw a, a, a thing the other day where a parent went up and punched an umpire and knocked him out because everybody's going crazy but we're blessed when we come and we're blessed when we go. Most of the time the officer is asking questions. Listen, if you've watched it, the officer is asking questions they already know the answers to. It's like watching Minister Society. Where were you? At 11.43. And, and, and you're supposed to answer, but, but you ever notice they already know the answers to the questions. And so they ask them where they were and they say at home. And then they say, no, you weren't at home because we came to your house at 1143 and you were not there. He said, did I say 1143? I meant 1043. Well, it couldn't have been 1043 because your phone triangulated at a gas station at 1043. Did I say, 10? oh, well, my sister had my phone. No, we already talked to your sister and your sister's in Brazil over the weekend. Did I say my sister? Have you ever watched the show? And so they build this case against themselves 
living in these areas, they've already triangulated the cell phone towers. They've already seen copious amounts of closed circuit television. They've, they've already uh, done multiple interviews. They've already uh, uh, done the protocol. And, and by the time they get to these individuals, the proof is already in the pudding. And that is a platform, listen to this, uh, that presumes guilt even though the presumption of innocence is supposed to be the gift of those intertwined in the legal system. Because in our day and time, we're supposed to be innocent until found guilty. But in the Twitterverse and, and, and on Instagram TV, we make assumptions about guilt or innocence without all of the facts. We make assumptions about the entire movie based on the 30-second clip. And, and, and we make all kinds of assumptions without the facts. And, and when I looked at this docu-series and, and I laid out all of its, uh, uh, all of its uh, intertwined parts, and when I laid it out, I thought to myself, I said, you know what? This would be a good way to investigate the death of Jesus. What can we learn about the first 48 in the life of Jesus that will give us some information on what actually took place? Because remember, Jesus was not the person that was originally designated to be crucified. There was a man already in prison who was about to be sacrificed by the name of Barabbas. He was already in prison to be, uh, to be killed, but, but because of the nuances, they brought Barabbas before the people, and they brought Jesus before the people, and then asked the question publicly, which one of these should I crucify? And they picked Jesus. The problem with this is a week ago, they were walking with him on Palm Sunday, throwing palms before his feet while he was riding on a horse that had never been written saying Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest and a week later they are saying crucify him, crucify him. Don't you ever fall in love with an applause. Because any hand that's close enough for you to hear the clap, you can also feel the blade. You can't stab me from a distance. You can't crucify me from another state. In order to crucify me, you have to be close. That's why you have to be careful with clapping hands. So when you're doing the forensics of your life and you're trying to find out where the pain from, always start with the clap. Oh, y'all miss what I just said. I know some of y'all mind somewhere else, but come back, come back. Always start with the applause. Always start with where somebody said congratulations. Always start with somebody said, I'll love you forever and I'll never betray you. Always start with somebody, I got your back and you look back and they way back. Always start. Because see, any real relationship has arguments and happiness. Any real relationship. See, you don't really know if you got a real relationship until we had a reason to fall out and we found a reason to come back together. We ain't real friends until we had a fight. Come on, somebody. When I'm looking at this, I thought, Jesus, you're being crucified. And if y'all don't mind, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I just wanted to say to Jesus, Bro, you ain't done yourself no favors. You ain't done yourself no favors. I know you're innocent, but I want you to know that your pattern doesn't make it look like you didn't do this. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make it look... First of all, here you are telling everybody, I'm looking to be seen with people who are lost. Now, how many of you all know that you are guilty by association? 
So here Jesus is. He's often found with prostitutes. He's found in the house of Zacchaeus. He's found in the house of a tax collector who is nefarious with his accounting skills. He's seen with the woman caught in the act of adultery. He's seen with all kinds of criminals. Who's not going to think that the man who's trying to be let off the hook isn't guilty when his company is guilty? Because you know you can go to prison not by pulling the trigger, but by being in the car with somebody who did. There is a crime called guilty by association. And so here Jesus is found with criminals trying to prove he's innocent. Here Jesus is around prostitutes saying that he's the holy one and that he's pure. Here Jesus is amidst the criminality and the most nefarious and debaucherous individuals in the world, yet proving his innocence is going to be difficult. His pattern does not look good. And let's wipe away his pattern. Let's just go to his birth. He's born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is such a deprived area. Listen, go back and study it that the people in Bethlehem lived in caves carved out of rocks because they could not afford homes. So he's born in the hood. Are you listening to me? He's born in a place where people lived in modified caves. One writer said that the town was without beauty. I want you to think about this. Now see, it's hard to get this because see in Houston, and I learned this when I moved here, Houston has some bad areas, but it also has some great areas. So in Houston, you can go to a ward and you can see poverty, but you can also go to the Galleria area and then you can see uh, gentrification in Midtown and you see third ward changing and you see fifth ward changing. But see, when you come from a place where I came from, Gary, Indiana, there is not one hotel in the whole city. When you come from a place where I come from, there is no Ruth Chris. There is no, we didn't, we don't even have an Applebee's in Gary. There isn't a hotel where you can spend the night in the city I grew up in. All of the schools that were open when I was born are now closed. And the elementary school that I went to is now a police station. The water in the city that I grew up in was contaminated by lead. So when everybody's talking about what's happening in Flint and everybody's talking about what happened in Jackson, I could tell you that in the 80s and 90s when we grew up, everybody in our neighborhood had to move out because there was iron two inches beneath the soil. And I'm still here. I've been drinking iron water all my life. So, so when everybody, all you bougie people that got to have bottled water every time, I have drunk so much iron water in my life, no wonder I'm strong. How many of y'all grew up, how many of y'all grew up drinking from a water fountain? Anybody grew up? When you drink from a water fountain, it is liquid metal. But when you are from a place that has nice places, you don't understand the place that Jesus came from. The place where Jesus came from, there was no inn, no hotel room. There was nothing. He was born in a feeding trough. The place where he was born, there was nothing. So, so first of all, he grew up in the hood. And when you grew up in the hood, you're expected not to make it. So, so where Jesus is born, uh, it, it doesn't help them. And, and, and so, so now the land is parched with the sun as a result of the shepherds struggling to feed their sheep. And then eight days after he was born, which also marks the day of his circumcision, his parents move to Nazareth. Now watch this. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was circumcised on what day? The eighth day. And his mother and father now have to pick him up on the eighth day and take him from Bethlehem and take him to Nazareth. And then the Lord gave me a revelation. He says, tell the people that just because you're bleeding doesn't mean you get to stay still. Oh, my God. 
See, that's why I came up here earlier to fight this devil that's trying to put a spirit of heaviness on this room. But we're going to make sure that we give God the glory because some of you all believe that because you're sore and because you're in pain and because you're in confusion, it means you get to stay in Bethlehem until you recover. God says, no, you cannot stay in Bethlehem until you recover. I want you on your way to Nazareth while you're bleeding because I got something over there that I need you to do. And you're going to have to do some walking while you're bleeding. Touch your neighbor and say, yes. You can still love your husband while you're bleeding. Yes, you can still be kind to your children while you're bleeding. Yes, you're going to have to still go to work and act like you got some sense tomorrow, even though they cut you. Let me just poll the house. How many people in the room have a propensity to shut down when you're cut? Look at Jesus on the move while he's bleeding. Now, are we saved by the blood? Are we saved by the blood? Yes. Then I would make the argument that if we're saved by the blood, I'm about to shout myself, that if we're sh saved by the blood, by the shedding of the blood of Jesus, then it means that I didn't get saved when he bled on the cross. If I am saved by the blood of Jesus, then it means I was saved on the day he was circumcised. No wonder eight is the number new beginners. I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but God told me to tell you every time you see blood, it means he's about to start something over. Anytime you see a cut, it means you're about to walk into a new season. Anytime you're bleeding, God's about to start the clock over. first time we see the blood of Jesus is not on Calvary. We see it while his mother is walking him from Bethlehem to Nazareth. Can I get you to move out of your seat and into the imagination of what it feels like to be a woman walking miles. Some say at least 93 miles eight days after having a 10 ounce, 10 pounds, 6 ounce baby. I'm guessing, I don't know how big Jesus was, but as big as he is now, I would assume he was born a big baby. I would assume he wasn't premature. I would assume he wasn't a small baby. I would assume that if he is so big that the world is his footstool, he had to be born big. And his mother is still bleeding at the same time as her son. And they are both bleeding in the private place. Oh God, I'm I'm gonna preach. You ain't got to. Yeah, the, so ain't, there's, you see, it's it's one thing to be bleeding from your knuckle. It's another thing to be bleeding from your nose. But it's another thing when you're bleeding in the private place. It's another thing to be bleeding in the place where you can't show anybody. It's another thing to be bleeding where, where, where nobody can see it. You can't tell anybody about this pain. You can't photograph this pain. You can't tweet this pain. You can't post. Anybody got any pain that you can't tell nobody about? Just touch somebody and say, I'm bleeding in the private place. I'm, I'm breathing. And, 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 and not only is it me, but it's everybody in my house. It's everybody in my house. I'm bleeding and, and he's bleeding and, and she's bleeding. And, and, and here's the thing, life is in blood. So when you're bleeding, you're losing life. And if you bleed too much, you lose stability. And here she is bleeding and ripped and walking. Bleeding and ripped and holding a baby and walking. Because I would imagine that if she pushed him out, she didn't let Joseph hold him. Because she said, this is my baby. And she's bleeding and he's bleeding. And he's screaming and she's screaming. And yet they've got somewhere to go. He's screaming and she's screaming. And yet they've got somewhere to go. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody in here. But have you ever had to get to a place? place so bad that you have to walk ripped and bleeding and crying and sob. Matter of fact, the reason why somebody is standing up early in this sermon right now and shouting is because they want you to know that's how I got to church this morning. I came here ripped 
and bleeding and they had traffic on 59 and we ain't never had that before but I got out for exit early and I waited in the line and I walked through the parking lot and I thought it was going to rain but I knew I had to get to Nazareth because I knew there was something that God had for me to do is there anybody in here that'll tell your neighbor I walked here I drove here I got here in pain bleeding in the private place bleeding in the private place and here I am bleeding and hurting asked to be a healer I want to calm Jesus down but I'm in pain myself have you ever been asked to give out of your pain have you ever been asked to be a healer at the same time you were hurting I, I, listen, don't y'all make me preach because I feel the glory of the Lord starting to come in this room. Have you ever, have you ever had to say I'm sorry, but you didn't do nothing wrong? Have you ever had to kiss somebody first who frowned at you? Have you ever had to hug somebody who looked like you didn't, they didn't want you to touch them? But for the sake of where I got to go, I got to do it when I don't feel like it. Oh, help me somebody. For the sake of the calling on my life, I got to leave while I'm bleeding. And I got to go to work tomorrow and I don't feel like facing those people. And I got to walk through that front door even when I feel like a stranger in my own home. And I got to love children who disrespect me. I got to clothe people who are unappreciative. All you know is I carried you there, but you didn't know I was bleeding too. Somebody said, but I got to get to the next place. I got to get to the next place. I got to get to the next place. And I'm preaching this because most of y'all quit when you get cut. Most of you quit when you hear the rip. But as I told you last week, when you hear the rip, when the veil of the temple was torn, the rip was the birth of the new generation of church. The rip is a sound that God is birthing something. So either you can either quit at the cut or you can move on. Let's poll the house. What are you going to do? the next time you hear a rip what are you going to do the next time you feel a cut you don't sound convincing because the truth is some of y'all ain't sure you've been trying to move on you've been trying to forgive your ex you've been trying to come in here and smile like you don't think everybody's still talking about it You still go to the family reunion wondering if they're still judging you. And see, what, what, what bleeding will do and what cuts will make you do is it'll make you stay away from people you don't like, which alienates you from people who love you. So here you are not showing up because one person going to be there and God sent 99 to pour into your life and you let one person drive you out of your destiny when God assembled a whole army of people who were going to pour into you. Matter of fact, you don't even know that everybody on your road right now has been assigned to encourage you. Just look at them right now. Say, God put you next to me and to encourage me. I can feel virtue coming from you. You've been through hell and high water too. You've had to walk with rips in the private place too. And this room looks like, I could be wrong, but this room looks like a room full of survivors. I could be wrong.
See, that's, that's what surviving sounds like. That, see, and I'm going to move on, but some of y'all ain't been through nothing yet, so that's why you're just sitting there. But if you just think about what, what you really had to go through. Anybody ever lost a parent? You don't even know how you're going to survive. Anybody ever lost a sibling? You don't even know how you're going to survive. But somehow God gives you a peace that surpasses it. Let's touch somebody and say, I'm here only by the grace of God. I'm here by the grace of God. I'm here by the grace of God. Shalene, listen, Shalene, look at, look at this pattern. Look at this pattern. Um, when I look at it, I think there is some guilt to be found just by being a judgmental person. Because first of all, his mama was 14 when he was born. So you know, statistically, when children are born to teen mothers, then there was a statistic on that because now you have a child raising a child. And by the way, if there are any teen mothers in here and you made it, we're going to sit here and pause for you because they thought you weren't going to graduate from high school. They thought you were never going to be nothing. But touch your neighbor and say, my bank account's still full. My house is still happy. And my soul still is anchored in. Somebody ought to praise God for teen mothers in this room. You didn't ask for it, but God still blessed you anyway. Now let me clear this up before a hater say online that I'm, that I'm cheering for teen mothers. No, I'm not. I'm not cheering, cheering for teens engaging in the activity that brought about the baby, but I'll be doggone if you're going to make me treat them bad after the fact. And if we got grace for your trifling self, we're going to have grace for them too. Now, I just want to get here, get a little attitude real quick, because people make me mad when they want you to stay mad at people who do stuff that they don't do, but then all of a sudden want to have a forgiveness party when it comes to they sin. Oh, have sin! You can edit that part out. Don't just, I mean, you ain't got to edit it out, but just fast forward through it. Don't put it on Instagram. But before I take it back, I'll add more to it. Well, Jesus, Jordan, Jesus, this dude ain't, he's not helping himself out. I'm just doing the first 48. He is the first runaway child we see in the scripture. Uh, the first Amber Alert. It was because of Jesus, because remember, they went to the custom of the feast. And, and he was 12 years old, and all of a sudden, his mom and dad go home. Now, now watch this. This is, this is ah, I ain't got time to cover all of this. The reason why this looks strange to us is because in America, we live in an individualist culture. But see, where, when I go to Africa, like where pa Pastor Paul out of Ferrison is from, they're in a collectivist society. See, when you get over there, honor is, is bigger than here. Okay, collectivists, collectivists, because they do things together. You see, but, but see, this is what struggle does. Struggle keeps you together. Success splinters. And so the reason why Jesus wasn't with his parents is because all of the, see, the village, he was with the village. It was okay for him to walk with the other family members. But just for the conjecture of our psychological capacity, he goes and his parents gets home and then they find out. Where that little boy at? So they got to walk three days back. To go get him and when they get back he talking back I'm telling you it ain't looking good so now he's he's been cut he's already been stabbed at eight days all right he's already had to walk while he's bleeding he's the child of a teenage mother and it looks like he ran away at 12 and when they find him they say where you been he said Phew. you don't know what said I claim you don't know who I am? I must be about my father's business. And he's a class clown because the Bible says when they found him, instead of sitting in the seat being taught, he's standing up in the class teaching the doctors and the lawyers. He got some nerve. So Jesus at 12 has the doctors and the lawyers sitting down and he's teaching them. 
Ask your neighbor, are you smarter than a fifth grader? He did not become a rabbi when we saw him in the temple. He was a rabbi at 12, teaching the doctors and the lawyers. Wist ye, Luke 2, 49, that I must be about my father's business. And then he disappears. For 18 years, we don't see or hear from him. The only thing we know is he was making furniture. He was a carpenter. Then I asked myself, what is a carpenter? Then I thought, oh, a carpenter is one that works with wood. And in three years, the carpenter would be on a wooden cross, working wood. Y'all in here. Y'all don't read the Bible, do y'all? He's a carpenter. He disappears for 18 years. And then all of a sudden at 30, he pops back on the scene and he's invited to a wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. And then when he gets to the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee, Mama Mary says, we're going to try this one more time. They said, we done ran out of wine. Now I need you to go back and do the calculations. There were six to eight water pots, 120 to 180 gallons of wine had been drunk. Now, I don't know about y'all. I have been to a few parties where the libations were free. But I ain't never seen 180 gallons of Hennessy nowhere. Come on, y'all, don't act like, I mean, have you ever been to a party and was like, damn? It's about to go down here, but it wasn't no 180 gallons. And for it all to be gone, I want see, I need y'all to step out of, out of Lighthouse, step out of online. When you get to a place, to a wedding where all of the wine is gone, everybody's not welcoming you in like this. Jesus comes in, they're like, whoa, hey, Sue. Man, we done ran out of wine. Jesus said, bring me the water pots. They said, we ain't asked you about no water. We said the wine is gone. Mary, get your boy together. Mary said, Jesus, they ran out of wine. Jesus said, what you telling me for? Oh, Lord, here he go again. Because I don't care how old you get, you ain't supposed to talk back to your mama. Come on, y'all. So here he is talking back to his mama again at 30. I'm telling you, the first 48 ain't looking good. <laughs> He's talking back to his mama. But let me tell you something. His mama must have been black. <laughs> because she didn't say nothing to Jesus. <laughs> she looked at him and said, uh, do whatever he says. Jesus, come on over here. Now, I done told you to make this wine, and you better make this wine. All of a sudden, now Jesus is in the miracle working business. <laughs> How many black mamas in here know that when your child tell you what they ain't going to do, a gorilla comes up out of the inside of you, and you're going to make sure? It's one thing a black mama ain't going to take, and that's talking back. She can take an F on your report card, but talking back is out of the question. You get straight up, you can get a tutor. You talk back, you're going to need teeth. That's two different things. <laughs> Do whatever he said. Jesus, get over there and make that wine. He makes the wine. Say, so, woman, what they got to do with me? What does that have to do with me? She said, do whatever. He says, my hour has not yet come. And to make matters worse, he himself went on to record in Luke 19 and said that it is the mission that he would seek and save the lost. To add injury to insult. Y'all see I'm making my case? 
the name of the sermon for those of y'all who just joined us is called the first 48 we're doing a forensic evidence trail on how it looked like Jesus was guilty even though he was not and it looks like he is based on his bring up he's born in the hood to a teenage mother he's seen talking back he done ran away from home looks like a troubled child and now we see him befriending a prostitute and listen <laughs> when he comes in the room when they come in the room Kim the prostitute is on her feet in front of Jesus and when they come in they say oh she was just washing my feet with her hair okay all right all right Jesus this is getting out of hand you keep making this stuff up it ain't looking good you're in a room with a prostitute and she is on her knees in front of you and you're saying she's washing your feet with her hair lock them up oh and just a few days later he's walking and there's a man named Zacchaeus who is a notorious tax collector who is cheating people out of their money, not only does Jesus call him down, he says, Zacchaeus, let's go to your house. And he goes to Zacchaeus' house, not only does he go, but he stays. So now, he's spending the night at the house of a criminal. Anybody wanna just say right now, what would you, if you were a juror so far, how would you vote? That's why they were yelling crucify him because they saw all of these facts. And the reason why we don't understand why they yelled it is because we did not. We come on the other side of the cross. See, you're approaching Jesus from this side of the cross. You're approaching Emmanuel from this side of the cross. All you see is the mercy seat and the blood, but they saw criminality. Oh, and by the way, when he's hanging on the cross, what is he hanging in between? He's hanging in between two thieves. And both of them are up there because they stole something. Until I started doing the forensics, I said, you know what? I actually see three thieves. The other two thieves probably stole possessions, but this thief stole the sting from death. And the victory from the grave. Touch your neighbor and say, I see three thieves. I see three thieves. I see three thieves. two criminals one of them one of them and this is about this is about perspective because one of them was like you know what he's going with the crowd crucify him crucify him the other one says uh man i don't know what you did i don't know what they talking about but if you real can you remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus says this day Thou shalt be with me in paradise. What if I told a thousand of you in this room today that because you've been hanging with Jesus this day, he's about to turn that thing around for you. I'm just, I'm looking for somebody. Can I just find somebody in the room? Say, I've been hanging with Jesus. I had doubts, but I've been hanging with him. I've been frustrated, but I've been hanging with him. I thought about walking away from him, but I've been hanging with him. And because I didn't give up on him, he won't give up on me. Now, I need about a thousand of y'all to begin to shout in this place today because you've been hanging with Jesus this day. God is about to turn that thing around. Give three people a high five and say, God's about to turn it around. If they didn't shout, you got the wrong three people. Find somebody who's been hanging in there by the hair on their chin, almost about to give up and quit. Tell them God's about to turn it around.
See, what you have to understand, one thief said, crucify him. The other one said, this day. He said, would you remember me? See, some of y'all have to realize that you don't have to have the same perspective of the people you hang with. I got to come down because see, you're missing what I'm saying. You got to realize that just because you hang around negative people don't mean you got to start becoming negative. That just because you related to jealous hearted people don't mean you got to become envious. You got to learn how to be around something and not become it. Just because you come from alcoholism doesn't mean you have to become one. You got to learn to be around something and not become it. Somebody shout, there's a different destiny on my life. I'm just trying to figure out, who is this word for? They both hang in there, but they come away with different things. It's just like this sermon I'm preaching right now. I'm preaching. Some people are going to come out here and say that I preached about something. Somebody else is going to come out here and say I preached about something else because what you have to understand is that we all hear through the ear of our trauma and need. And whatever problem you came in this room needing to solve, you're trying to bend this word subconsciously to fit the narrative that you came in here with. But the Holy Spirit is saying you got to open up your heart and you got to open up your mind. Watch this. And hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. want to hear. Somebody say, Spirit, speak to me. Speak to me. Come on, open up your mouth. Spirit, speak to me. Let me hear what you're saying. Don't let my trauma transpose this word so that I walk out of here with something to argue about, an opinion that I already came in the room with. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. That's why he was able to be in paradise because he heard who God was and not what he thought everybody else meant. He said, so if you can just remember me when you come into your kingdom, he got saved on the cross, which means that this doctrine that we have to be baptized in order to be saved isn't true. Show me where the thief was baptized. He ain't never been to church. All he did was simply believe. Oh, you're not getting this. All he did was simply believe. He didn't speak in tongues. He didn't have oil on him. He wasn't anointed. He wasn't a deacon. He was just simply a believer. And because he believed on God, God said, this day, You'll be with me in paradise. And don't worry about the baptism because you shared in mine. When I was baptized, you were baptized. When I received the spirit, it wasn't imminent for you. But now he is a helper for you and available for you. And by the way, I'm going to teach you when we get here on Tuesday that when Jesus Christ got out of the grave, it was the Holy Spirit that resurrected him. Oh, God, help me in this place today. I'm trying to get you to understand the difference between the Godheads, between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Helper. And that we have a psychological conundrum in our mind about the personalities of God, and we're always talking to the wrong person. That even Jesus needed the Holy Ghost. Amen. Whose life am I helping with this? Is this transformational for you? Come to, my wife came to me and she said, babe, don't move off of this. She was right. She was right. And let me tell you something. Learning to trust the right voice. Learning to trust the right voice because I know we got a preaching calendar. They will tell you, I already have the next 12 months of preaching. Do you all know what I'm going to be preaching in October already? We have a preaching calendar, but every once in a while, you got to pause your calendar to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And let me tell you something. There is no, you all don't even know whose presence you're in. And you're going to hear from them later. I'm going to have them greet you. But one of the most powerful voices in Africa is in this room right now. The biggest church building that I've ever been in in my life. The pastor is in this room today because I hear God saying the spirit is connecting America and Africa. 
and Africa needs America and America needs Africa and this is not about the black race this is about the human race y'all better hear me and God is going to use us to turn around the works of the enemy because it looks as if the devil is winning but because Jesus is a carpenter and he does cross work Are y'all listening to me? On the other hand, just something happens in the other thief. The thief hung on the cross and refused to follow the crowd. He even looks at the other criminal and says, I don't share common values, but as far as I can see, this man has done no wrong. There's a shouting point there because in the first 48, one of the ways your name can be cleared is that God will send an eyewitness. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I know the Lord gave me this word. See, you too busy trying to clear yourself. Just be consistently good, and God is going to send somebody to whisper in your enemy's ear and say, she is who she says she is. I'm, I'm just looking for my section. I'm just looking. Who am I talking to? Because somebody been lying on you. They got people thinking things about you that are not true. And here you are trying to defend yourself. God says, don't worry about that. I'm a sin and I have witness. And it may not come when you want it. It took him three years. But they're going to eventually say, he is who he says. You never see Jesus trying to clear his name. You only see him about his business. Stay about your business. Stop trying to clear your name. Stay about your business. Slap your neighbor and say, stack your chips, boo-boo. Get your money together. There is nothing that shuts an enemy's mouth up quicker than a resurrection. There is nothing that makes your enemies look like a liar than you getting up when it looks like you were counted out. Slap somebody and say, I'm getting up out of this thing. There's an eyewitness coming. <laughs> Yo, say somebody, there's an eyewitness coming. There's an eyewitness coming. There's an eyewitness coming. There's gonna buy, there's somebody's gonna come and say, they ain't been nothing but good to me. And all it takes is the right one person to say it. When you do it, you got to do it individually. So here you are fighting an omnipresent body, battle in a present body. You come in on everything online, which makes you look guilty. See, you don't understand this. You're defending yourself. But anybody who goes into a court of law without a lawyer, we call them a fool. Because every time you defend yourself, you look foolish. So God will send you a lawyer called the Holy Spirit who will argue the case. And let me tell you, he is a lawyer that has never lost the case. Touch your neighbor. I ain't going to lose this battle. I ain't going to lose this battle. I'm not going to lose it publicly. I'm not going to lose it privately. I'm not going to lose it physically. I'm not going to lose it emotionally. I'm not going to lose it psychologically. This is the day that the Lord has made and we ought to rejoice. Can I just make a pronouncement in here? I got to go. I'm just going to be your eyewitness right now. Okay, I'm going to be your eyewitness. Anybody ready for me to tell you what the Lord said? Because I've seen it. Okay? Now, if you ain't ready for this, go on and stay asleep. You can stay seated. But for those of y'all who want to be seated in heavenly places, I'm an eyewitness. I know what the Lord told me to tell you. All right? You ready? This, this is what I saw. You're healed. You're blessed. You're favored. You're free. You're prosperous. 
you're an overcome. I'm an eyewitness. I know what he showed me. Now, everybody who believes the word of the Lord, open up your mouth and give God the glory. Shout it, yeah! High five, three people tell him, I'm free, I'm favored, I'm blessed. 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 I'm free, I'm favored and blessed. Oh, and guess what? If I'm blessed, then that means you're blessed. Because if he's blessing your neighbor, it means he's in the neighborhood. Somebody shout out bless! Shout out bless! You better learn to separate from the thieves that steal your joy. See, y'all don't know the, the art of separation. Whenever you hanging in between people who don't share your perspective, separate. I don't agree with tithing. Well, you stay over there. I know what it's done for me. I don't believe in being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, can you stay over there? Because I know what I believe. You got to learn to separate yourself from negativity. Separate yourself from people who are not going anywhere. Separate yourself from people. Because if you don't, you will be hung just like them. Watch how he separates himself. Because I'm going to show you when most people try to say, am I still helping you? Let me show you how most people try to separate themselves by trying to act like they right. They try to separate themselves by acting like they're better. This is what he said. I'm guilty. I stole it. Now, will you remember me? See, one thing you got to learn, you better start learning how to tell your story so the devil can't use it against you. Oh, I want to talk because I see, I know y'all, y'all like to, mama said what goes on in this house, stays in this house. Look at your neighbor and say, I've been nasty. I've been divorced. I've done drugs. I have drank until I almost passed out. I cuss. I act a fool. Here I am, I, Lord. Save me. Look at all you fake people. Not me. Not me. Not me. I've done nothing wrong. I'm of I'm the aristocracy. And the, no, you better go all have sin and come short of the glory of God. You better, matter of fact, I need somebody to just shout, I am the chief sinner, but I need to be saved by grace. That thief said, I did it. I stole what they said. I stole. I did what they said. I did. I went where they said I went. Now, can you remember me? Here you are trying to sweep your stuff under the rug. No wonder you can't get to the next level because your rug is like a mountain and you can't get over it. Because you keep sweeping everything. Use it against you. See, Daryl, something always happened when God remembers. See, Noah was almost gone until God remembered. <laughs> God remembered Abraham and saved him from his nephew Lot he remembered Rachel and all of a sudden a woman who couldn't have a baby her womb was opened somebody said Lord remember me y'all remember that said do Lord do Lord remember me somebody say Lord remember me when God remembered the Hebrew boys, they were able to walk out of the fire. When God remembered Daniel, he was able to walk out of the lion's den. Somebody say, Lord, don't let me forget. Let me remember. Had God forgotten Joseph, he would still be in that pit. Something happens when God remembers. Why? Because the reason why he remembers it is because it is actually his strategy for the body of Christ 
which is why in the upper room when he was talking about the bread and the wine, he told them as often as you do this, do this and read. When the Bible says that he rem remember him, it doesn't mean cognitively remembering. It means the reassembling of the members of the body of Christ. In other words, God says, I am in a season right now where I am remembering families. Oh, no, listen to me. Listen to me. Because this is going to be the part of the sermon that's going to take some work. Because some of y'all don't like your sister. Some of y'all got a problem with your brother. Some of you still done fell out with a cousin. You still, got, you still got issues. And God says, how can I remember if you keep remembering? I can't bring it together because anytime it gets close, you remember what separated it. And I can't get you back together. And by the way, I'm going to teach you Tuesday. I'm going to give you a sneak preview. How many of y'all say you want to re receive the Holy Ghost? The first thing you got to do to receive the Holy Ghost is repent. See, you keep thinking this is about shouting and, 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 and fluff and, and, and feeling good. No, all of it starts with repentance because the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in an unclean temple. So if you got unforgiveness and hatred and grudges in your heart, the Holy Spirit says, I'll move in when you move out. And because he's not homeless, he can wait on you. If he was homeless, he would have to hurry up and get in. But because he's already in me and he's already in him, he can wait on you because he's not outdoors. Anybody here filled with the Holy Spirit, just tell your neighbor, he can wait on you because he got a home. He got a home. He got a home. He can dwell in me. The Holy Spirit hung in between two thieves. Two people who was who were nothing like him. They didn't share his values. They were not like him. They didn't have his mindset. They were not like him. Which means that you cannot be Christ-like and not be able to hang in between dysfunction. See, anytime somebody ain't like you, you got to get away from them. Uh-uh, that, uh, that energy is off. That ain't the right vibe. But how you gonna be like Christ and can't hang in between people who ain't like you? See, anybody who has to get a, away from things that are not like them, what you're actually saying is you're not strong enough to stay the same in their presence. I don't need you to change for me to stay the same. I'm going to stay centered whether you get to the left or the right or not. Whether you got joy, peace, sorrow, anxiety, whatever you got, it ain't going to get on me. Here's what the Holy Spirit just told me. He said, tell the people that they need to learn. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You need to learn how to go through things without letting things go through you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Somebody, you better write that down. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's good. You, you need to learn how to go through things without letting those things simultaneously go through you. Are you here with me? Jesus sat at the table with the publicans and the scribes and the Pharisees, and he saw them eat with the sinners and said... How is this man eating with sinners? You, you do know that people are, are they're just sitting off watching you. Just She thinks she cute. And a, he think he's somebody. You do know when people tell you what you think without asking you is that's a way of telling you what they think. No, you think I'm cute. That's why you said it. And I appreciate you. I thank you. Because it was my goal when I got up this morning. I appreciate it. 
<laughs> I tried to do it. Jesus overheard them and said, um, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, when you get the Holy Spirit and you become Christ-like, you see people's deficits in personality as an opportunity for you to pour into their life, not abandon them. Let me just look at y'all. All right, I got about three or four faces out here right now. Let me tell you, one face is like, you right. One of the faces like, I'm going to hell, ain't I? <laughs> I don't want to go to hell, but this is hard. And then this, this is the third face. I'm still going to be me. And in hell, you will lift up your eyes. Because when you listen to me, once you become saved, there is only one thing that can send you to the belly of hell, and that is to be against the work or blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. So you can do all of this shouting and be saved by the blood, but quench the spirit and still. Wee! The reason why I'm teaching this is you think this is planned. This is serious. This has eternal consequences. Why would you go to church for 30 years and can't master this and you would have wasted your time? All right. Man, what happened to him? Pastor Paul, like 30 minutes ago, I, we had three people hanging from that light. We had six people run down that balcony. They was in praising God. Listen now. Now see, this is, listen, this is the sound of deliverance. So when I was a younger preacher, I used to get intimidated when y'all get quiet. I'm a gangster now, I don't care. The quieter you are, lets me know that that target done zeroed in. You ever got a whooping by your mama and, and you couldn't cry? It was, this what this what that whooping, this that first hit. Pow! That's nice. He even played in my scream key. Did you hear that, huh? Let me finish this up. He said, truly, I tell you today, the truth is that something is getting ready to happen today. That's what I came to tell you. Something that somebody just say something's going to happen today. Now, what I'm getting ready to tell you, don't you ever forget. The word today in the Greek translated means, are you ready? Who's ready? When the Bible says today you will be with me in paradise, the word today in the Greek is translated in English vernacular, already done. Okay, listen, because when I say today, some of y'all thinking, okay, well, sometime between now and the rest of the day is going to happen. No. Not here. When you woke up this morning, it was already. Before you got dressed today, it was already done. High five somebody who got a smile on their face and just tell them it's already done. Come on, find somebody, tell them it's already done. 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 I can finish if y'all will get the picture. Somebody shout, it's already done. The business, it's already done. The healing, it's already done. The report, it's already done.
today. Marks the transition from your cross to your crown. And if you don't believe it, it will be the only thing that stands in between you and your resurrection. That's why the disciple says, Lord, help my unbelief. Because God is not enabled. Sometimes we are unbelieving. He's not unable. We, un we just don't believe. He can do anything but fail. And if you believe it, it can happen today. That's why the woman with the issue of blood was healed immediately because it was according to her faith. She bled for 12 years, but the moment she believed big enough, he told me to tell you it's going to happen. Today. Today. What's going to happen with my child? It's already done. How many of you I got a child right now you're looking at and you're like, I don't know what this one's going to be. I just, I just can't. It's already done. Somebody's got a doctor's appointment this week. Raise your hand if you got a doctor's appointment this week. Look around, y'all. I know, I know when I feel the Holy Spirit. Look at, look at me. Look at me. You nervous. <laughs> it's, you hear me? Already done. How many of y'all got an interview this week? Okay. All the people getting an interview, stand up. You got an interview this week. Look at your boy. It's already done. How many of y'all gonna get the results to a test that you've already taken? Stand up. Y'all look around. I know what I'm talking about. Look at this. Look at Pastor. It's already Done. Now, the only thing you have to do is act today, now, like it has already happened. What are you going to do when you hear the job is yours? What are you going to do when you hear no cancer? What are you going to do? When the doctor says, I can't find nothing, let the redeemed of the Lord. Don't y'all make me feel good in here. Snap your neighbor. Give your neighbor a high five. And shout, neighbor, it is already done. If you believe it, open up your mouth and shout, yeah. Oh, yeah. Give your neighbor a high five. And shout, neighbor. God told me to tell you, in the next three minutes, you're about to feel a sense of calm coming over your life because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. If you believe it, open up your mouth and give God the praise. I'm trying to hold my mule. I'm trying to hold back. I'm trying to not get excited. But when I think about the goodness of Jesus, ah, and all he's done for me, shouting, yeah. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. It's gonna be all right. By the way, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained. 
deep within, uh, seeking uh, to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. And from the waters, he lifted me. Now save, save am I. It was love that lifted me. Why am I singing the song? Because after the first 48, God told me to tell you that after all the things you've done, here is what the jury said. Not guilty. Y'all hear me on this side. Tell your neighbor, I did it. You can catch me on the camera, but it wasn't me. Somebody shout, not guilty. Because the account was settled on the cross. Constructed in eternity's past by the carpenter. You don't pray for victory, you pray from victory. Before the foundation of the world, he was already the lamb slain. And those who he predestinated, he foreknew, which means we were not introduced when I gave the preacher my hand. He knew me in eternity's past. And now I am righteous because he made me righteous. Now, from predestination, what I am preaching to you about is sanctification. And this is where the church gets stuck on the pendulum because Jesus paid it all, but the Holy Spirit is a helper. You got to do this part. When that urge to speak in an unknown tongue comes up on you and you resist it because you don't want to seem fake, you're resisting the Holy Ghost. I don't know how to speak in tongues. Yes, you do. You just won't because you're carnal. I know you know how to speak in tongues because when you get mad, you cuss people out in languages that are not customarily in your vocabulary. You can change language if you want to, but it's easy for you to do it in the flesh. It's difficult for you to do it in the spirit. We're going to break that stronghold come hell or high water. There is nothing in the scripture that says that the evidence of getting the Holy Spirit is in how fast you can move your feet and dance. Somebody show me. I've been reading it all my life. I can't find it. But there is an evidence by speaking in your heavenly language. But you have to receive the Holy Ghost. Because when he got up there, the Bible says he gave up the ghost. And when he gave up the ghost, that was an earthquake. Because when the spirit moved, all earth removed. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. See, when the, when the Bible talks about the earth moving, it's talking about you. that when the spirit moves, you have to move. And when you resist quenching the spirit and you can't receive the power that comes with the Holy Ghost. I'm talking to you at home. You can receive the Holy Spirit in your living room right now. When 
you read the book of Revelations, the Bible says that the Spirit spoke to the angel of the house and then to the church. The Spirit is speaking. The Spirit is speaking. And here's what he says. The day you hear my voice, We say harder, not your heart. That's the scripture. But in other words, he's saying, don't resist me. You have to receive me in. Because if you don't receive me, remember, I left to go to a place that there where I am, there ye may be also. But how can we meet there and we can't meet here? Just open up your heart right now. And just keep saying, Lord, I receive you. I receive you. You're the Lord of my life. I receive you. I receive you. Let him know that you are available to him. The whole reason why he created you was to be an earthen vessel to give heaven full expression here on earth. When he created you, he created you so that you would be an ambassador to bring heaven to earth. It was never merely about making heaven. It was about thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And there wasn't much that he could do on earth because the dominion of the earth, he left it to you. And he did not include himself in that dominion except through you as the Holy Spirit of God. So lift those two hands right now and sing this song in its first stanza and let him know that you are available to him. I want everybody who knows how to sing to sing. of the Holy Spirit I want you to use that heavenly language now and speak in another tongue let's not hide him in the back room and allow him to voice himself when we pray in the understanding we pray about the things we understand and when we pray in the spirit we pray about the things we do not know about hallelujah go ahead and lift your voice right now and begin to speak in another tongue for those of you who are believers, lift that right hand right now and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that I am made of the same substance as the Creator God. And that your creative life lives in me. And because He does, He also gives me utterance to speak in your language to you, a language that all of heaven understands. And declare together with Him, that, oh God of heaven, everything standing between you 
and your purpose for my life. I release it from encumbrance and I ask that now, right God, do your will in the midst of my life and begin to speak in another tongue. There's somebody here who has not released your life in surrender to Jesus Christ. By the help of the Holy Spirit, I want you to run to this altar right now and say, I'm available to you. If there's somebody else who is not in a state of full usefulness to God, I also want you to race to this altar and say, God, I am available to you. I want you to inhabit me, creator of the universe, the ends of the earth, and all that is in the Milky Way, the one who made it all, what we've never seen with our eyes. I'm available to you. I'm available to you for you to inhabit me. In his word, he declares to us that he can see anything. He can see everything. He is omniscient. He knows everything, but one thing God cannot see through is he cannot see through the blood of his son anything else but the perfection of his son that means he's given you full credit with the same level of righteousness as his own son so that he can treat you exactly the same way that he treats his son he can exalt you the same way he exalts his son he can give you the esteem that the, he gives his own son simply because he cannot see through the blood at your faults he iterates this in 1st John chapter 4 and verse 17 we are fearless in the day of judgment for as he is so are we in this world come quickly come right now you're struggling with something in your life and you feel it's a limitation or a hindrance well let me tell you because of the blood you have the one who surmounts limitations who surmounts the odds and is able to bring you to a place of guiltlessness as he points to what Jesus did on the cross because that's that's all he does he won't speak of himself he'll speak about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary he took your death so he could give you his life he took your shame so he could give you the pride of being a son of God he took your, your failing and he gave you his success come now come now and come quickly friends Come quickly, he wants to do something in the midst of you. He wants to do something in the midst of you and then we're going to pray together. Not merely for salvation. Salvation is, is the first step, it's the door, it's the foyer into the kingdom of God that is governed and ruled by a family of kings and priests, persons uh, who know how to represent him so well the way your pastor does, but, but persons who also know how to represent humanity before God so humanity can see him the way his son Jesus Christ sees him so that they can be to this earth and this world exactly what Jesus was, replicated in the millions, now the billions of people that are believers on the earth. Before we pray for these who have come, for these who are coming into a greater consciousness of who Christ is to them or Christ is in them, I want you to lift up your two hands and ask God for these three things. Number one, we're going to ask Him for light. We're going to ask Him for light. The word metanoia is the Greek word for repentance. Repentance does not necessarily mean what we think it means. It means to change your mind about how you see God. And God wants you to see Him the way His Son sees Him. Hallelujah. And we're asking for light, the light of God. And you pastors, the one over this house who brings light to the house. And then number two, we're going to ask God to shed light in your path. God, what were you hoping for when you created me and consequently called me from my fallen state? What were you hoping for? I'll tell you what God was hoping for. He was waiting for you. He's hoping for you to make earth become a literal heaven. And it's a process, but it reaches the level of acceleration when the king comes the second time. 
Hallelujah. And until then, we are the king's embodiment. Glory to God. Then the third thing we're going to do, we're going to ask God to shed light on the riches of the glory of the creator life, the creator himself who's in us, who wants to have expression through you the way that a falcon fighter bomber needs expression when it goes to war. But you and I can't give that fighter bomber expression because we don't know how to fly the jet. The only person who knows how to fly you in the heavens is your manufacturer, your creator. He knows how to bring the best out of you so you can do things that you couldn't do, but now you can do things that only God could do because he designed your vessel exactly for that purpose. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to shout, let there be light in my life. And the way he brings light is through his spoken word. On the count of three, I want everybody to shout your loudest shout. One, two, three. Father, let there be light in my life. Say it again. Father, let there be light in my life. Third time. Father, let there be light in my life. Now release your heavenly language. And when you pray in another tongue, you're removing hindrances that you don't know about. When you pray in another tongue, you're opening the door of your mind, your heart. Say to the king whose knocking you have heard outside his own house. Say, whoever will hear my voice and bid me enter, I will come in and make some exchanges with him. Release that heavenly language now. Pray with your understanding. Pray with your spirit. And remember that the word of God that you pray is spirit and life. Hosea said that God told him, tell my people, take ye word and return unto me. Because his word that goes forth out of his mouth, it cannot and will never return to him void. But it will accomplish the part to which he sent it till there's fulfillment on earth for the word of God that is settled in heaven. Let there be light in my problem. Let there be light in my family. Let there be light in my health. Let there be light in my circumstance and my situation. Go ahead, don't stop praying in your heavenly language. Pray about it. Secondly, I'm sure time is against me. We want to pray that all that God was hoping for in the particularity of your own vessel, what you were created to contribute to bringing heaven to earth. Heaven is not in meat and drink, but it's in righteousness, peace, and joy. It's not in word, but it's in the power of the Holy Ghost. You're asking him, Father, what you were hoping for. One of the things for me is that we're looking for an Africa that will be heaven on earth. It's the richest continent in the world in terms of mineral resources. It's yet the most misgoverned continent in the world and the most exploited continent. That's what he's hoping for from every African leader. Leaders of homes, houses, families, church, institutions, governments, etc. What was he hoping for when he created you? America, what was he hoping for? When he made you the strongest nation on the earth, the empire of the world, and the likes of the Medo-Persians, the Babylonians, that now America is, is the great nation that controls and influences much of the world by the stature, the status God has given. What is God hoping for from your life? For us to come and have great church? No. No. No, no, no. It's not about having great church. It's about building heaven on the earth so people don't even have to hear you preach and they see because your life preaches and they want to see heaven through the prism of your content so they want heaven on earth at the lowest common denominator the individual then the nucleus of the family then the community until the knowledge of the glory of God covers the earth as the waters cover the sea how do the waters cover the sea completely and it's going to happen when Adam fell Satan took the Godship of this world from him 
took it from him. That's why the scripture calls him the God of this world. He took it from Adam. God was never intending to be the God of this world. He's already the God of the universe. He has the freehold on everything in the Milky Ways. But he gave the leasehold to man. And man then is supposed to govern in that leasehold just the way his father in heaven governs on earth. And even in the time frame of the leasehold, God is still in charge only of those who are his children. There's hell going on in this world, but God is not the cause. The trouble in, in Yemen, the trouble in Sudan, the trouble in our schools and institutions where, where young boys wake up and take these AR-14s and start killing people. God is not responsible for that. He didn't do that because this is not his dominion. You as an individual, you are his dominion and you're responsible to be his proxy regency here on earth. It's not about trying to be righteous. It's knowing that you are righteous and living from that righteousness to do God on earth. You are God's. And the scripture cannot be broken. You are sons of the most high. Why are you royalty? Why are you kingship? Royalty just means governors. Because you're meant to govern on earth the way you see your father govern in heaven. That's why you don't like to not be in charge. Because it's your nature, your divine nature, your creator life nature to be in charge. But the charge is for a reason. Till heaven is properly tangible in earth. So we're going to pray right now. That what God was hoping for in your particulars, that you will know it. What was he hoping for? I thought he was hoping for a church building. I, hope, I thought he was hoping for a better nation. It's all inclusive. But he was hoping for heaven to be fully represented on earth. And we all contribute as parts to make that whole. Ask him to open the eyes of your understanding and to enlighten them with the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge as to what he was hoping for when he called you. Release your prayer language, release your, your understanding and begin to pray. Sholia. Shirubakuraski brigidio sotolobohoti. Raguzali botos brulia. Brulilia sutrigasku lila lila lilu to the anime has. Morekos marika ruba liso grundu yusi la budie. He cosale no lo sotiribioro oro. Miraskus shirakula briese lede. Speaking in tongues is not the only evidence of the immersion, the saturation with the Holy Ghost. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your young men, your young women, your old men and your old women, they'll see dreams, they'll prophesy. In other words, you will see the future and the ultimate future is when heaven comes to earth in a fullness. And tongues is only part of the equipment for you to speak in it, get the interpretation of it, or take the shortcut and prophesy what God shows you. That's authentically His purpose on earth. Otherwise, all we're trying to do is build individuals' lives. It's a step, but it's more about bringing all the lively stones together to build a habitation for God, not in one person, but in a corporate enclave of systems, not just members in particular of a house. And then not just the house, but a combination of houses reaching across the pond, across the whole world, till God has made a temple not built of brick and mortar. Jesus looked at them and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it again. I'll raise it up again. 
They thought he was speaking about Herod's temple. But God had long since left Herod's temple. And he had nowhere to rest himself. That's why Jesus had to come, part of why. And once he was incarnate, he had two types of life inside of him. The life he got from his mother, humanity. Finiteness, mortality, corruptibility. And the life he got from his heavenly father, for he had no earthly father. And that was the creator life. To get, wrap your head around that a little bit, you have to see creation in its fullness. And we only see the creation of the earth and things we can see through a, a, a telescope. But there's much more to creation than what's in our solar system. I don't think he made all those planets in their billions so that they could just exist in places that are arbitrary. I believe that one day we're going to govern the universe, the whole universe. That's a lot of government. It's a lot of government. And it will be so harmonious across the galaxies, the solar systems, the entire Milky Way. And you won't have competition with anybody. It won't be necessary. But on the level of the use of your ability and your opportunity, he will give you systems on that scale and more to govern. Earth is just a speck and time is just a speck in the expanse of eternity. But it's where God looks to see, not that he doesn't already know, how much can I give you? How well are you going to use this opportunity to get ready for an eternity of governing the universe? I want you to say, God, put light in my understanding. Don't leave it in my spirit. Put it in my understanding. Make me hungry for light till I understand why I am on this earth and didn't die in the car accident or didn't suffer crib death. Why I'm still hungry for your word. Why I'm still hungry to be in church. Show me my purpose. Show me my purpose. Some of you have so much favor, but we must not misspend that favor on arbitrariness, things that look good in men's eyes. But what looks good in God's eyes, I want you to ask him, show me my purpose. It's the only place where fulfillment is. I have many friends who made billions of naira and some of them billions of dollars and they're not fulfilled. There's only one thing that can fulfill you and scratch your itch. And it's not money. It's nothing in this world. It's the fulfillment of divine purpose. Nothing else will give you forensic peace. Ask him right now. Say, Father, I want to know what you were hoping for when you created my father, Adam, and when you created me in him. I want to know what you had in mind when you incarnated your son Jesus and when I was created in him to walk in from the foundation of the earth. Ephesians 2.10, go ahead, ask him if you really want it. I want to know what your purpose is for my life. I don't just want to know the beginning game. I want to see the end game. Even if it's only in glimpses, I want to see it all so I can do it all. It's more than I owe, I owe off to work. I go to pay bills every month and survive the deficit. The time is running out. My inheritance is in you. Your inheritance is in your pastor. It's in each other. And when God put it in you, he didn't put the oak tree or the forest of oak trees in you. He put the acorn. And your job is to be the soil that allows that seed, that seed capital of the creator life condensed into you. Because the creator is infinite. He doesn't live in time. He can participate in it. He lives in, or rather time lives in him. He doesn't live in eternity. Eternity lives in him. He's bigger than eternity. If you can wrap your mind around that, it's like taking a glass and putting it in an ocean. The glass is in the ocean. And even though the ocean is in the glass, the ocean is much bigger than the glass. 
So when he's in time, he's not constrained to it. He knows the end from the beginning. I want you to open your mouth now and I want you to say, God, show me what you were hoping for when you created and when you called me. What are you hoping for? That's not a prayer that should ever end. It's a progression. Let's pray for these who have come to the altar. And those of you who have come, it's really about saying, I'm making a statement of faith by being here in front of everybody that I really authentically want the Creator Himself to live inside me. And you're not clean enough and you never will be. But He made you clean by blood that's sitting on the mercy seat. When it says we're saved by the blood of Jesus, what it means is blood means somebody died in your place. It's, it's the doctrine of substitution. Somebody died instead of you. He took your death so you would never be guilty for anything you've ever done before in his eyes. So that because of the blood, when he looks at you, he sees guiltlessness. That's why we are not afraid in the day of judgment. That's why in his eyes, we are just like Jesus in this world. And if you want that, here's your free access and open door. It wasn't priceless, or rather it wasn't inexpensive. It was most extravagantly expensive. I want you to lift your hand and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for adoption, whereby you sent your Spirit into us, that we as sons like Jesus can cry out to our Daddy, and know that He always hears us. And my first cry this morning, Daddy, is please come and live in my heart and in my life. Come and take over the seat of my will, the seat of my thoughts, the seat of my emotions. Come and take it over. Be its governor and its king. Be the savior of my soul. I thank you for what you contemplated before the foundation of the earth and that you manifest 2,000 years ago. Thank you. And I believe that by my faith in your finished work of grace, that right now, even though I'm not fully conscious of it, I am seated in heavenly places in Christ where I'll be forevermore in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for these who have made this confession of their faith. That as it has been spoken from the crucible of faith, heaven had pre-heard it from before the foundation of the earth and thereby had foreknown their choice today. That they will enjoy predestination and the attendant justification. And that by heeding this call to be all they can be and to allow Christ to be all he wants to be in them, they will come into the glorious fulfillment years on this earth where together we fulfill your purpose. This is our cry. Now open our eyes to see the exceeding greatness of your power toward all of us who believe that was first demonstrated for us to understand and see when you raise Christ from the dead and set him at your right hand. Meaning in the place of supreme authority. And we have you raised together. All who believe on him. Who will not blaspheme the finished work. The primary advocacy of the Holy Spirit of God. So that as He governs the universe, He will first govern our lives, govern in our families, and govern as servant leaders in our communities.
that the knowledge of your glory covers the expanse of our fields with the knowledge, the intimacy of your glory. Now, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your glory, your Shekinah glory, your unfettered full expression of your true worth and inexhaustible value becomes the envelope in which every man and every woman here are set and settled. And right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, out of the rich bowels of Calvary's ground, I release glory in your life. Oh, I want somebody to say amen. I release glory in your life. Oh, that amen sounds too shallow. I release glory, even the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in your life, in your work, in your health, in your body, in your understanding, in your growth. Our Father, let sick bodies be healed. Let broken hearts be mended. Let blind eyes that have not believed our gospel, let them be opened. Father, give us the heathen for our inheritance and the nations for our possession that the body of Christ in these closing ages or years of the church age of grace will supernaturally come to enormous revelation of who Jesus Christ is till his easy pickings, low-hanging fruit, the whole planet. Till we take over the White Houses, the parliamentary halls, the shrines of justice and equity, to the marketplaces become the dominion of your sons and your daughters. May the spirit of divine royalty, kingship, rest upon these men and women. And most of all, our God, we ask that those who govern well in the smaller things, you'll give us many, many cities many realms, many dominions that you might have even more expression with those who have been faithful in little that they'll be faithful in much. Those who have been faithful in much will become faithful in the enormous. Do it for your name's sake. Father, for the blood, for the death of Jesus who took all our past, present and future judgment on his body where you condemn sin in your son so that we may have the life, the zoe of God the Son himself working in us and through us. Do it and help us to be so collaborative with you and properly yielded to you, never, never driven down with guilt, never burdened with the verdict or sentence that you pronounced on Adam, but freed, as the scripture has said, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sentence, the law of death. This we declare over this house saying now unto the king of creation who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to this creator life within us let there now be glory in your church worldwide across all the continents and ethnicities peoples and places and reconciling not only this earth but this world to your original purpose. So we pray. The name that guarantees us an answer, the name of the one who lay in the grave and on that third day raised him up to glory. In the name of our King and Christ, Jesus the Lord of glory. And amen and amen, says the church. I want to prophesy. Can I have a towel please? I want to prophesy to you for a moment. I originally came to share a word with you, but I got encumbered. 
And I want to tell you that inside three days, God's going to build you back. And this might not be for everybody, but somebody who's died and you don't have to be a carcass to be dead, been buried, and the obituaries were published and they said, you'd never come out again. You'll never come out of it. In three days, you're coming out. What does three days mean? Please understand that 24 hour days did not exist until the fourth day of creation. That's when he made days 24 hours. 24 hour days did not exist in the first, the second, or the third day of creation. And so days until that point simply meant a period of darkness followed by a period of light. And days begin in the dark, not in the light. Hallelujah. So somewhere in the third day, after you've been through one season of darkness, quickly followed by a season of light, and then another season of darkness followed by another season of light, you're coming into a third day. And if you read the scriptures carefully, he said, destroy this temple, referring to his body, where God lives, where he always intended to live. And in three days, I will build it again. There's a power called the power of resurrection that's going to hit your life somewhere in the seasons of your third day. For the Hebrews, the word yum expresses opportune time as a period of daylight arising where priorly you only had darkness. Meaning you couldn't see your way out, you couldn't see your way through, you couldn't see your way over, you couldn't see how the promises of God would ever come to pass because your mind was darkened to possibility. But the psalmist says, weeping will endure for a night. But joy will come in the morning. The Bible says this is the yum. That's the Hebrew word for time considered as daylight. This is the day. This is the time. This is the daylight that God has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. And you don't have to wait for morning to come before you start rejoicing. You can rejoice knowing that surely as the night is, so will the daylight. And that the day will come. And I want to release that over you that you are coming through a chronological movement of the progression of time. And somewhere soon in that progression of time, you're going to enter what the Hebrews call et, what the Greeks call kairos. And it will open widely. And the last time it opened, you were not as wise to take advantage of the opportunity. But this time, you know better. And you're going to move into the open window before it closes. And the things that you never thought could happen for the fulfillment of God's purpose and the fulfillment of God's favor in your life are going to begin to happen for you like they never did before. Because the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. Nor is bread to men who are wise. Nor is our riches to those who are uh, of understanding. But favor happens to those who time has chanced. Hear me somebody, you're about to come into your time. Just make sure you live through the darkness of the night. And remember that darkness is not a thing, it is the absence of light. And God has guaranteed that every time there's darkness in your life, uh, it's going to end when he brings the day of light. This is your day. And it is also his day. And in his day, his people shall be willing. May God bless you. Please give it back to your pastor. Listen, we're going to give real quickly. But before we do that, I want you to understand something about who you just heard from. And because I know that if you don't know, you don't know. He has the largest gathering of people on the continent of Africa. There's something called the experience. Have you ever heard of the experience? One million people gathering together for worship. Uh, the power that he commands presidents, prime ministers, uh, heads of state. Um, it is amazing what he's built in Africa. And to build what he built in Africa where he just expressed to you uh, where 
they are the riches in minerals, but perhaps the most impoverished. What he built, listen to me, I promise you this, what he built in Africa, no man has built in America. To build what he built in Africa would cost us $200 million in America, easily. It's the largest facility under one roof for worship that I've ever been in in my entire life. And a lot of you all say you want to go to Africa with me. How, how many of you say you want to go to Africa? I mean, they don't get out of church in two hours in Africa. Okay, so you don't want to go. Look at you. You don't want to go. You'd love the idea of it, but you want America. Um, you want to go? I know y'all want to go. I know y'all want to go. Um, but I wanted you to know whose presence you were in because you are in the presence of a sage, a general, a potentate. I want you to praise God that you got to breathe air at the same time as Pastor Paul out of Ferris. And come on, Lighthouse, stand to your feet and give God some glory. All right, if you need an envelope, raise your hand real quickly. Those of you all who are online, if you're still with us, we're getting ready to give. And then we're going home. There's nothing after that. The instructions are coming up on the screen. The instructions are coming up on the screen. You can give by text. You can give by the app. You can give by web. You can give in person. If you need an envelope, uh, our ushers will serve you quickly. Tell your neighbor, thank you for staying. Just tell them, thank you for staying. Because see, what you got, what you just got, look at Pastor, look at me. What you got is just a pronouncement over your life. Some people are in a hurry to go get Popeye's. What they're going to get is high cholesterol. You're going to get a blessing. No, you don't understand. The amount of milk. When I went to his church and preached at House on the Rock, the amount of millionaires in the front section, you have to understand, there wouldn't have been any room for you to sit because of the amount of millionaires that have been raised up under that anointing. Do you understand me? The pronouncement that has just been placed over your life will last you. Some people left here to go get Popeyes. By the time God finishes with you, you'll own several. That's the kind of glory. Talk to me, somebody. Somebody say, that's the kind of glory that's in the room. My old pastor used to tell me, we're always in a hurry to go nowhere and then complain when we get there. Amen, somebody. Amen. I know your feet may be hurting, but if Beyonce was in here, you'd be standing up. If Kurt Franklin was in here, you'd be standing up. If, if, Jay-Z was in here, you'd be standing up, so it's nothing st wrong with standing for the King of Kings. Amen? Amen. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. Some of y'all was disappointed when your name didn't get picked in the raffle. Amen, somebody. When it comes to the things of God, we're always in a hurry. I don't know why, but sometimes it takes God some time to bless you. Amen. I remember when I was in high school, how many of y'all remember when the Jordans came out and we used to go wait in line to get them in the morning? Y'all still doing it? You ain't got no hookup. That's why you need to get you a hookup. People will wait in line on Black Friday for a TV that ain't even... It's not even worth it. They'll get in fights at Walmart about it. But when it comes to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I'm not under I don't understand our fatigue, but the Lord is working on us. All right, when you get your envelope, when you got your gift, I want you to stand on your feet. I know what kind of pen this is, Pastor. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes. Look like it's mine. You ever picked up something that looked like yours? When? Everybody lift it. As I move towards greater, I will accept all divine ideas, thoughts, and concepts that will connect me to my destiny. Say it like you mean it. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, and will do to me. And because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. All of my millionaires scream in this place today. All of the billionaires make some noise. 
There's more, y'all. Amen. Pastor, give to my right, your left. Let me pronounce this blessing over you, and we're going home. Morning, it'll be all over. Ain't no need. For the night is going to break. us pray dismiss us from this place never from your presence and that blessing that has just been bestowed on us let us walk in favor everywhere our foot shall tread give it to us in Jesus name the healing is ours the job is ours the increase is ours and the peace is ours in Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Hug somebody on your way out. Tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. We'll see you right here next Sunday on Mother's Day.